because help you. Don't know anything. very interesting in many ways. A lot of people said you're crazy to go out there, and aren't you uh, claustrophobic on that? Well, this submarine is, you know, 400 and some feet long. It's bigger than a football field with many, many ups and down decks, and we had a crew all together, about 140 men on board. So it's. Well, this, is, of course, is all nuclear-powered, and 16 armed missiles, when we got away from the U.S., they couldn't arm them until we got a certain distance away. <laughs> Makes you feel better. And the last step of arming it mechanically, the guy had to go in and physically turn like a key on each one, because until then, they're not fully armed. So that's where I slept, in the missile compartment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just one thing I'll add to that about my submarine experience that we had uh, nuclear torpedoes aboard. Yeah. We had Mark 45 torpedoes, which at the time was hush hush, and we knew about it. And I didn't even speak of it for 10 years because they said, This is top secret, you can't talk about this. Of course, it's all come out in yeah. print since. But all those ships have nuclear torpedoes. Every, every Navy warship. And yeah. I don't think ours were because this was a little earlier. This ship was put together in the late 50s. We had torpedoes, but I never asked what was on it. Uh, we already had 16 armed nuclear missiles, so I suppose a few more torpedoes I wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have been much. The other thing you mentioned, depth. Cruising, we were often many hundreds of feet, three, four, five, and so on, which was fine, but we would go down, in fact it probably was classified for years how much, but after a thousand feet you begin to notice the difference and when you're down under the ocean 1,500, 2,000 feet there's a lot of pressure and when you go down there are these giant beams for these engineers here would all begin to bend <laughs> and moan, they make this awful moaning noise when they were compressed because there's tremendous pressure on you know, on the uh, structure, whatever you call those huge beams there. And that's when they go around and look for leaks because under pressure the leaks would develop. And you always had leaks, as the more professional guy said, whenever there is a hull piercing you're going to get a leak because they, things have to go through the hull and no matter how many O-rings and what other types you get in there under certain pressures you're going to get some leaks and they'd mark it so the next time we were back they could try to fix it. But I never liked the, the, the noise I found very disturbing. <laughs> the moaning and groaning. The other was very disturbing, I up our way, uh, by the way this submarine was built in New London at the uh, Electroboat Division down there in New London. We left for New London and sailed across the Atlantic and then went on duty and sailed all around. I don't know where we were because I didn't track it much, but the sailors know after you went north of 50 or 60 degrees they got Arctic pay so their salary went up for the days <laughs> that they were further north. <laughs> the other thing that up our way where they had, they used to make submarines at the port up there in uh, in the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Now they just do maintenance on them. Some of the submarines were built at Mayor Island out there, which in, in California there. Um, but ours up there in Portsmouth, they had a fire on one of the submarines recently, and it was all, all published and all over, and it did hundreds of millions of dollars of damage and so on. I don't know what happened to get it. But what I was amazed, we were on one patrol, 63 days, and on board we had five fires. If you are not happy when you are sitting in the wardroom at 400 feet down and all of a sudden there's smoke billowing through the vents <laughs> and you don't know why, you don't know what it is and what's going on, um, most of them were pretty innocuous. Three of them were the same cause. I hope they fix the equipment later. The dryers, the clothes dryers, weren't getting the lint out right when they get too hot. <laughs> the lint would catch fire in the dryer, but it generate a. I guess it wasn't dangerous, but it sure would generate a lot of smoke. And, an, and uh, another guy, I, as Jeff said, there's a lot of smoking in those days. Many, many of the guys on board were smoking, which they claimed that the 
they could taste hydrofluoric acid because the cigarettes took it out of the air. It was, it was good. We had a lot of things they had to get out of the air. Uh, it was hard for that long to recycle and make the air good. So they could always get enough oxygen. We were always running oxygen, plenty of oxygen. But they could never scrub out all the carbon dioxide to get it low enough. And, uh, you know, now we talk about 400 parts per million of, of uh, carbon dioxide is going to be very dangerous. Well, we weren't 400, we weren't 1,000, we weren't 2,000, we weren't 5,000. We weren't 10,000, we were about 18,000 parts per million, almost 2% carbon dioxide, so, because they couldn't get much more than that out. And uh, it wasn't, some guys claimed it caused them headaches. I don't know, I was fine, but uh, some people were more sensitive to the high carbon dioxide level. Uh, the final, one of the other fires, See, people had chemicals they shouldn't have, and one of them had like shellac down in one of the things, and somebody was smoking, and somehow the fire kaboom. got near an open uh, shellac, and kaboom! Which, I don't know how, uh, how fast or how volatile shellac is to fire, but that was the cause of one of the other fires. Anyway, when I came back from that trip and some touring around Europe, where uh, I didn't see Steve, I didn't see Ed Cops, but I saw his brother, Steve Cops, and uh, some others while we were there. But as soon as I got back, I started on Apollo. But I want to back up just a little bit before that to talk about how we got to this, this point. The, um, I started work at Draper Lab in the late 50s. I went to graduate school. I was going to get a more advanced degree, but eventually I gave up. It was just... Uh, I wasn't suited for it. I first worked at the Draper Lab in the summer of 1954, and I worked for a guy named Wally Vanderver, who was the first real mentor. He spent like an hour every morning explaining to me what, and I became an expert on analog computers. There weren't very many digital computers yet. There were a few. IBM had some. And they were used for special purposes, but for the first four or five years after that, I did a lot of work with analog computers. I got very good at putting analog to together. You have to wire them to really make them do right, either big wiring for like a GPS or boards that you put it on a board and plug it in, like on the React. And we used that a lot. I, then I went, after I gave up on grad school, I went, joined the Polaris program at the Instrumentation Lab, which is now called the Draper Lab. And then for about five years, I was on the Polaris program, and that's why I ended up on the, on, as a civilian on the submarine. But I learned a lot, first, of computers while we worked on Polaris. It had a very special type of computers, and uh, actually I got a chance to design a computer that did the data reduction, the computer called Derek. And uh, we had big modules because everything was discrete. That was before integrated circuits. And you'd make a little pla a module that they'd pot and make a little square, and in it would be a transistor, once in a while, two, some resistors, some capacitors, with a lot of things. And you pl pluck, it, pluck it on a printed circuit board, and they're all soldered in there, and that's how they did computers in the old days. And the Polaris computer wasn't much more advanced than that. And we had to go out to Utica, New York, GE built them and try to get them out early, turn them out there, having trouble getting the production to be all right. Anyway, there were a lot of uh, in, ins and outs. I should mention that uh, Ed Copps joined me at that time. We shared an office working on Polaris. And uh, Bard was working over at, across the street. They all, we were all working that time in the late 50s. All right, then I get my chance to go on the submarine. Actually, uh, for Polaris, I ended up working for a guy named Dave Hoag, who was just the most, the, he was a, taught me what it is to do engineering. I had done plenty of schooling, but I didn't really know how you did engineering, and he <laughs> was a great guy to teach us young people about what, what engineering was like and also what tech, uh, ethics were, what integrity and engineering was all about, and so on. It was a 
very, very good time. Then I came back in uh, mid-May of 61 and went and they said, we need some people to work on this new program. Didn't even have a name yet. The people at the lab had put out a, 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 a proposal to do a flight to Mars, self-contained something or other, and several of their big guns had worked on that. And then NASA gave them a small contract. In those days, small was a couple hundred thousand dollars to work for a few months. And then in August, we were awarded the first contract for Apollo. By then, it was called Apollo. We were a prime contractor to NASA. And so we started working on the, uh, well, we were working in May, but it was very slow until August. And then we began to really get going and hired other people. And uh, Ray Morth, who is a, also from MIT, he was in late 62, and then Bard Crawford came soon after it. And the three of us did a lot of stuff. And, uh, yeah, I'll take the papers out, I guess. Um, here is, for instance, our engineering report. It's got all three of us on it, and it shows the sort of things we put out. This is July of 63. We actually did some as early as late 62. The second piece I'm going to circle, I'm going to have as many goodies as I can to pass around, and then we'll talk more about it. This is the actual read-only memory that they used on Apollo. And you want to start this one the other way? It's what's called a wire rope. And it was a strange way of getting read-only memory, but in the early 60s there weren't an awful lot of choices. Uh, the regular volatile memory was all cores read -only anyway. Memory. And this made read-only memory out of cores because they wired it up to do a specific task. And they had people out at Raytheon that would follow these directions and, wire, core, and wires went through it. And then it either circled a particular core or didn't. And so the program was wired in. You can take it out of the uh, oh, we can? plastic if you want. Oh, OK. It's, Where is it? I have, I think it comes out easily. I haven't done no, it. I think so it's, I think it's sealed. Is it sealed? Yep. All right. It's sealed. I don't know if it's Maybe sealed. one in a vacuum. I guess. <laughs> you can also look at this, which tries to tell you what it is if you want. To. Anyway, the uh, the computer by today's standards would be slow, bulky, and incredibly big, but they were pretty limited uh, in those days. The actual building of it started on Apollo using these little modules that we, like we did on Polaris. A lot of the same people worked on it. But they moved as soon as they could to integrated circuits, which weren't very <laughs> integrated. But even that, and I think in 1963 or 4, Fairchild was building these things. And Fairchild said that the Apollo project took 60% of their output of what they called integrated circuits. The integrated was just a little chip that had the equivalent of two transistors and some other things to kick it, to touch it together. So this is integration. Two transistors in one, in one packet. Now they're in the millions, I am, I am sure. Anyway, the uh, let me see if I have anything here in notes. Anyway, we've got Actually, there's another one of these I can pass the other way that uh, Bard and I and Ray put out this. This is the, the en engineering, the way you did engineering in those days. And the way it was done is we wrote computer programs, simulations, ran the simulations, see what happens, and then change it and try again and again. So we heavily used digital computers. We had a couple of them, and then we got a couple of big IBM 360s when they came out in 64. And, uh, but it, it was real, uh, real engineering, although it was for products that you never, as Bob Piper said the other day about something else, uh, faith-based engineering or something <laughs> like that. What did you call it? What was your phrase? Faith-based engineering. This was faith-based, faith-based engineering, 
because none of this stuff had ever been done before and we did the best engineering that we could. We, 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 we thought we had all our bases covered, but you never knew. And it was interesting that a, a lot of mistakes popped up and we had to, you had to find them and correct them. Programming this thing is really, really difficult. Uh, the computer wasn't very big. It didn't have, had, had a 15 bit word and it did things by words. Most of our scientific was used two words, but that still isn't very, very long. We didn't have any floating point. So using all those scientific computations, like you see written there, where we're generating trajectories and Lambert's equations and solving all these things all had to be scaled properly because without floating points you've got to know how big it's ever going to get and how small and what scale factors that you're applying because if it gets all the way up to almost one that stands for something. For instance the velocity I remember very clearly in measuring velocities it was scaled to be two to the seventh centimeters per second. Now, uh, that's, no, no, two to the seventh, I'm getting it all better, two to the seventh meters per centisecond. I got the wrong thing in there. That's <laughs> 128 meters per centisecond, or 12,800 per second is what it was scaled to be. So 12,800 meters per second is enough to get you to the moon and back. It's, it's mm -hmm. more than 35,000 feet per second. But we had things scaled and there wasn't standard, there wasn't a standard product here. Everything had to be checked. Did this guy do it right? Did this work out? Have you tried it? Why didn't it work right? And you'd find the most amazing little bugs with many people doing programming. One guy in there had a program and for instance, there wasn't just one place that you had pi, which is what we're used to in a sensible program, but because of all the different scaling, there'd be many other pi's. And one guy used for pi uh, 22 over 7, which is a sort of slide rule approximation. Well, when some of the results didn't look good, everybody was trying to figure out why, and then finally buried there, we could find this guy who was, he was 22 <laughs> over 7 as pi. Uh, it's good enough for two or three places, but in this case we needed, we were dealing with something that needed six or seven places, not whatever you got 22 over pi. And another one that lasted for a long, long time. We, in order to compute stuff turning and going, you had to have earth rate. And there wasn't just one standard earth rate. People had it embedded in all these different equations or different parts of the system. I worked on, I should have started with what we did, I've hopped all over. I handed this thing out, Bard and Ray and I were the re-entry group. That's all the re-entry group for many, many years. And when we moved to block two and got digital autopilot, which we also added to it, Bob Barron's father joined us. Most of you guys are too young to know who he is. Ray will, or Piper will remember. I remember him. Do you? Sure. Bob joined us and he did the digital autopilot for the reentry part of it. So we got it cranked out. We were done pretty early. By 63, we pretty well had hammered out what we did, wanted the equations to look like and what they should do. And he added the digital autopilot. There are a lot of SAEs involved in all of this, as you can beginning to see. Meanwhile, Ed Copps has joined us and he's over there running powered flight. Uh, so he's uh, working with a number of other people and most of us all worked on the command and service module. The LEM came a little bit later. They had to deal with Grumman, which they were difficult to deal with. We dealt with North America out in California and down and they were a lot easier to deal with. We didn't get a lot of resistance where they said it's had to go my way or else. Mm -hmm. But it was my first real contract contact. I had been the Navy. By the way, when I was doing the Polaris, we had to deal with the Navy group in Washington, SP-23. They were really good. They were supportive. They were smart. They knew what they were doing. I was so impressed with the Navy when I did it. And most of NASA was pretty good because they built this thing from scratch. They didn't have leftover 
stuff. They had a bit, they bring some from Langley and others and sent them all to Houston after they got yeah, yeah. going and very good guys there. I like Chris Kraft a lot. And NASA turned out to work, be worked very well. By the way, Chris Kraft came up to visit MIT not too long ago. A guy named Aaron Cohn was running a seminar course up there. And I we attended and listened to him. And someone asked Kraft, well, is NASA capable of doing a new Mars project like they did Apollo? He said, no way, there's not a chance they could ever do that. They don't have a capability to do anything like that. And uh, that's the inside word from the who is director of the Manned Spacecraft Center for there in many, many years. He thought they had rigor mortis had set in. They'd become old and they weren't doing so much anymore. But anyway, I think it was North America the first time I visited doing the backup entry out there in California. We had the primary guidance system, which there's more goodies going to come around, including some pictures of it, if anybody wants to look at black and white pictures. The guidance and the disky look like this. Anybody, this, you can start another one. The, the, in, the astronaut interface was real. It was what you had in 19, the early 60s. They pushed little buttons, and there was, a, there was no visual display. There were uh, program had three two-digit numbers and three five-digit numbers, and that was it. Anyway, the uh, we had the entry system all designed, and it was all pretty automatic. And then North Americans said, well, we better have a backup. Well, NASA said backup. So they were doing a really quick and dirty backup system. And uh, we went out to talk about it. And there were three of us doing it at MIT. And for the backup system, which was just almost, we considered trivial, we'd had a, yeah, one guy and some worker on it. And in the room, there were 12 guys, and there were some more outside that were all on this, what we considered a tiny project. And I knew the head of it pretty well. And I asked him, Jesus, how do you even work? You got so many guys, how do you know what's going on at all? And he looked at me, a very straight face, like I was the naivest guy in the world. He said, don't you understand these government contracts for the, like this? They're welfare for the middle class. <laughs> <laughs> he probably knows that. <laughs> anyway, that's, it's still going on as far as I know. The F-35 is such a screwed up program and they were going to spend trillions of dollars on that. It was just laid out. Any of the people could have said it wanted to be one plane that satisfied the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines. So for the Navy it had to land on carriers, the Air Force for their high speed, and for the Marines it had to go vertical. And uh, whenever you try to be all things to everybody, it's such a mistake at the beginning. It's a big expensive way, it's like a uh, toaster oven. It's not a very good toaster, not a very good oven. <laughs> <laughs> And this was worse. It was trying to do three of them. There's a great TV program that has two hours that somebody puts on showing of all the competition between Boeing and Lockheed Martin for this Joint Strike Fighter. And it goes on and on. For a lot of us, it's, we thought this, this only happened maybe 10 years ago. They had a fly-off. They each built a plane and we're trying to fly it to show what it would do. But neither team really could make it do vertical takeoff without changes. And it's always had a lot of compromises. I don't know. They have so many other planes. I, I don't know. I guess they have a lot of people that want to buy this F-35. That's a joint strike fighter, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, we spent the 60s uh, up until, well, Early 60s, we did all our design, started 62, 63, by late 63, we were pretty well done. And then our job was that we didn't have a big programming group, so it turns out we ended up having to program it for the AGC, that's the Apollo Guidance Computer. And programming it turned out to be a lot bigger job than us engineers ever thought it would be. And. Uh, well, I'm hopping around a lot. Interrupt any time you want some questions. Dan, when did you switch from analog to digital? 
in the late 50s, actually Bard started using our 650 computer and he said, you should really try this. He said, we, they had their own system called Mac that worked really well on the digital. It was designed by Hal Lanning, was really good. So I started using the 650 in the late 50s. And um, I, from then on, I was almost all, we took some of the Polaris and took it up and had a com combined hybrid analog digital and showed that it worked all right. But on the Apollo, I was all, it was, digital all the way. My son doesn't even know what an analog computer is. <laughs> and he had no idea how he worked and I had to try to show him a little. But um, let me show you two things and I'll come back to the other. This is really haphazard but we'll... Come on. Here's what computers rooms look like in our days. Which way do I start? Here, we'll go this way. There's still circles. This is a computer room in the 60s. With a 650 or late 50, you can see it's black and white. Unfortunately, I'll give you some other colored ones there, but it's interesting that uh, you see how big the equipment is. And that was they used to have a um, disc, which was a big. Before that, everything was tape, and this is a a 650 with random access disc Ramac. That was a big adventure. But the disc plates were about this big around, <laughs> oh and it stacked up, yay high. Oh. And you could watch the thing slide up, yeah. and the thing go over. It took seconds to get to a piece of data, for God's sakes, but that was as much as it was. One thing I want to notice as you go around here, do you notice that uh, there's three people do in the computer room working oh. on it? Women. They're all women. women right? uh, that was very true. The w we in our occupation, at 1960, half the programmers, roughly, we have trouble. I've gone and looked over old phone lists trying to figure out. And my sister went to work in the early 60s. She was a math major, like a lot of the computer people. And as soon as she got her degree, she went right to work for IBM, who sent them out. But she was on the business side, which is 1401s. Some of the people may be here old enough to remember terms like that. IBM used that for their business computers, byte oriented and did stuff. 1401s. And COBOL came out about in that. I knew the scientific. We worked at MIT. We visited all the government facilities, Dahlgren and aircraft companies. And we saw all the, they started at 704, 7090, 7094s, tape oriented, big digital computers. And half the programmers were always female. They did a lot of the work. They were usually math majors. They were very good. And of course, the engineers didn't think they should do the programming. That's why there were so many women who came in and did it. They got trained. They didn't have a lot of others. And they took really good math people from colleges and trained them to program these computers, exactly what my sister did. However, in the mid-60s, the colleges started computer departments, computer science departments, and they got really geeky, and they did things that they thought were so, so important. Well, what happened is a lot of women didn't want to go into computer science departments because all the strange men who, were, who inhabited them. <laughs> so the number of women doing programming just plummeted through the 70s as computer science departments proliferated all over the country. And by whenever you see statistics now, like the pro working programmers are about 10% female or something like that. There's no reason. I work all of our work at Draper and the others, we had a huge number of uh, women who did the programming and uh, they were very good as very they're very detail oriented. <laughs> I can remember people saying that about programming. But there were men and there were women, they're very good at at uh, we worked closely and got a lot of this stuff done. Now yeah. let me turn back I, to I can mention one thing too, just an example of that. Uh, I, again, this had to do with ICBMs, and we worked in the targeting group, and we had a group of programmers yep. that actually developed the software yep. to help us analyze the performance of the ICBM and to predict the targeting of them. And I had a woman programmer that I would work with. Yep. And you had to work as a team because there was this image of engineering versus programmers. You sort of looked at them as 
not inferior, but they're not really. As there was a bit of that. They in were days. they were a little lower level, and I remember writing a progress report where she was supposed to have this piece of software done by a certain date. And so I'd check with her and then I'd write a report and say, uh, software not completed until such and such date. And on the next report I wrote the words, still not done. Oh, oh my God, I got a call from my boss <laughs> who got a call from her boss that said, Comparado used the word still. <laughs> she, he's inferring that, you know, she's behind. And she was uh, oriental. And from that point on, I had trouble getting along with her, just because I used the word still. But it just showed the mindset between the programmers and the engineers. You know, we were saying, you got to have it done by time. And I used the word still, and well, all hell broke. Still wasn't that bad. In some uh, who, who, did your, who did your programming? Did you actually go out on contract? She was just an old mountain girl, but they all loved her still. Hey! <laughs> 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 Did you go out on contract and grab a company that did the uh, software? Later, program? we had to. We were trying to do it all ourselves early, um, and we did all. We did the reentry between uh, Ray, Bard, and me. We got it all done, and then Barney had the autopilot. But later on, it turned out there were so many oh, other pieces, yeah. and then there were so many missions that they had right. multiple ropes. They called these that they released with the read-only memory that they had to bring in. They brought in another hundred programmers from wherever they could find. They brought them from SDC in right. California. Yes. They brought them from GM in Milwaukee, uh, their uh, Spark Play C division. They brought them from uh, CUC, SDC, everybody you can think of. So did you build the simulator yourselves to check out the we were all digital simulators. First, we just wrote our programs like in Fortran. It was with another. Here is another one. By the way, before it goes too far, see if there's somebody you know in the upper middle there. I should hand it back to John. Don't focus on me till I go around. I should have said something before. There's two, you there's two men there. Is that yes. Right? Let me see if you know who that who that is. This fellow on the left. That's Doc Draper on the left. Let me go back to these guys, and then you can start. The one right here, Doc Draper, he founded the lab. Uh, Draper? 70 Draper, what's now Draper, uh, on instrumentation. And the guy on the right is Werner von Braun. Oh, my hero. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. Whoa. <laughs> He's my hero. I will tell you this, Werner von Braun is a Whoa. very good audience when you lecture to him. Uh, he is Good. He asked questions and knew what she was doing. And uh, you like talking to people who get intelligent responses. And he was very, very good that way. He wanted to know exactly what we were doing. And of course, he was building that seven and a half million pounds of thrust. That's when it takes off. Five of those engines on the big thing. And I've been in Florida when it went up, and the noise, and you could just feel the shaking. There's seven and a half million pounds of thrust, oh, thrust as it yeah. leaves the ground at about 1.01 g's. <laughs> it just barely gets going until you begin to burn off some of that fuel. Anyway, speaking of good audiences, I also had to give talks in these early age, 62 to 63, to the ast astronauts. The first seven astronauts were called the Mercury astronauts. And you talked to them, it was fine. They, they weren't bad, they were friendly, they were very nice. Uh, John Glenn in particular was very outgoing and very, uh, maybe that's why I went into politics. <laughs> and I remember about five years later, I was in a plane flying from Washington to Houston. We had to go to Houston at least once a month. I was sitting in the back by myself looking at something, all this guy came up and said, hi, how are you doing, what are you on this for? I looked up and it's John Glenn, and he came over, he recognized me from some of our talks and wanted to know what I was going down to Houston. He was a real gladhander, all right, he, but I liked it. However, then came nine more astronauts, the second batch, and when I talked to them, the first time I talked after that, 
my reaction immediately afterwards, I went to him and I said, who the hell was that guy up front? There was a guy asking all these questions, and then I, they told me, oh, that's uh, Neil. Neil Armstrong. And I said, oh, well, I better keep my eye on him. He was, he, we were much longer than to Von Braun. We gave a full hour, maybe an hour and a half, and he was full of, well prepared, full of good, insightful questions. He was a real engineer. In fact, that's what he came from. And he knew what was going on. He knew what happened. By the way, a number of the other ones in that second group were really, really good and helpful. Jim McDivitt was one of my favorites. He was right out there from, uh, he went to Michigan. He grew up about 20 miles from where I did in Michigan. There's still a, a, a Jim McDivitt something or other in Jackson, Michigan. And uh, we had three of them up with us. They were assigned to us at MIT in 64-ish, 65. Jim McDivitt, uh, <coughs> Dave Scott, and Rusty Schweiker. Anybody go to school? Rusty was at MIT, MIT in the right. class of about 57 or so. 56, 57, 58, something yeah, in there. Something like he was an arrow, but I don't know anybody in arrow then. Rusty was very, very, very bright too. And poor, they made fun of Dave Scott all the time because Jim and Rusty were, they'd get anything like, bang, bang, get the idea. And then they'd say, you know, you got to repeat this for Dave. He's pretty slow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was right, he wasn't quick. He was more of a, plotted through and got things by very methodically going at it. But they worked, they were up there most of the time for a year and a half and I got to know them pretty well. By the way, who mentioned Bill Lennar? Some you did in there. When we saw the thing of Bill Lennar, I called Rusty, actually I think I was sending him an email, I can't remember what I did, and said, you know, I just got this information about Bill Lennar and asked something about it. He said, oh, we know that all. That We've all been informed. They were all that close. Those groups of astronauts were all very close. So the information went back and forth very rapidly, a lot quicker than I'd get it. Rusty I liked a lot. He was on the mission and really, really capable. The problem was the mission he went, which is the first Earth orbital, first uh, where they had a limb, so they had to do rendezvous. It was uh, uh, Rusty Schweiker. I guess all of them were up with us, Jim and so on. Maybe that's why they were up there with us. And uh, it, he got air sick. He got very sick on that flight. And that was it. They would, you're dead if you get sick on one of those. We aren't, we aren't going to send you again because we just can't waste having uh, an astronaut out there that might might get sick and can't do his job. But I still stay in touch with Rusty. Actually, he's lived all over California where we are. He, he lived for a long while in Tiburon, then he lived in Sea Ranch for him. He lived someplace else there. And right now he's living in Sonoma out there. And Rusty is in charge of that thing that's supposed to identify all those astronauts. Uh, I mean astronauts. Asteroids. <laughs> and his... Uh, his little thing is named for that planet in... Le Petit Prince. Yes, thank you, Sue. Yes. What's the name of it? The Little Prince. The Little Prince yes. came from a planet called Six Something B. Anybody has read The Little Prince by the French mm -hmm. guy? And so his working group has that same name out there. And they try to get money, he writes articles, and they're trying to... Someday an astronaut is coming. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> Hopefully it's a millions of years. But <laughs> asteroid. Asteroid. Asteroid, asteroid. Asteroid, sorry. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Asteroid's coming. They, but they want to identify and know when it is. Recently they said there's one coming in 28, but it turns out it's not going to be all that close. But they, they don't know till they really... First they got to find it, and then they have to track it long enough to extrapolate. The close one in 28 is supposed to come back in uh, 2036, as I recall. But he, uh, he's still very busy, and actually someone else now is, well, 
none of us are very young anymore and Rusty is sort of backing out and there's another ex-astronaut that's more running his little group. Now, next toy. <laughs> uh, here, well, we'll do one each way and I'll explain it. Here's what we actually use. This is presented at many conferences. You can, sh two things, show you what we did and how primitive the technology was in those days. It's probably dated. Here's a chart that controls everything. If you know that chart, you know everything you needed to do an Apollo reentry. And uh, but in order to make the chart, nowadays a computer would just spit us out. We had to get all the points, we had to go down to the technical pubs and they would do it and draw it out and hatch it. And it, it was a long process to get any of that out. Dan, uh, would this still work today? Oh yeah. Yeah, what this says, atmosphere assumed is 1959. And they have a better atmosphere model, but not. they don't change very that, much. They change in the fourth place or something when okay. they do it. Uh, that was the standard atmosphere model in those days. There's now one. They still use one from the late 60s, I believe, because after they did enough tests, they know all about what the atmosphere model is, shows as you go up in altitude, what all the uh, pressures and temperatures and everything is. Density. Density and so on. Uh, if you're at, uh, it's around 18,000 feet is the half-life, or half whatever you call it, so if you go up there, you're only going to get half the oxygen that we get here at sea level, which is a problem. When my older son climbed Kilimanjaro, that's like 19,400 feet, and they don't have any masks or anything. So you have to get acclimated to the altitude. Reef. The last day's dash, they go up at like 2 in the morning, and they get up there for sunrise. They say, I think just so you get there to see the sunrise, the base camp is about 17,000. They do the last couple of thousand up. But I think the real reason, he said, was they didn't want anybody to see what they were going on. <laughs> they might back out if they could see the narrow trails they were going up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as you go up and up, you get less and less. The part that they're worried about when they launch a spacecraft is is uh, maximum Q. Q is what's called the dynamic pressure, one half rho V squared. So as rho goes down as you go up, but V goes up, yes. up and at some point you hit the maximum effect of the maximum wow, dynamic pressure. Now if you look at this funny chart, what's interesting, this is what's called an equilibrium glide. An equilibrium glide is the point where everything is balanced out. It's not a flyable model, but it's a point which you can, uh, where if you have a lift vehicle, the Apollo uh, re-entry vehicle had an L over D of uh, 0.3, an airplane is up in the single digits, maybe Bob Piper, or maybe our airplane people know what they are now if you have a real airplane. But this was just a big capsule. It got really, really hot. But in order to control it, you needed some lift because otherwise you were just like a rock. <laughs> you just took whatever it is. And the problem with controlling it, you had very little control. We had one control variable. We could rotate the spacecraft by firing little jets because it was being hammered by the wind and it was stable enough so it would keep the same point right into it which you could roll about the thing so you could readjust the lift vector up, sideways, down, and so on. Well, we were trying to control most of all, we held the G's to no more than about seven or eight G's. And if you come in too steep into the atmosphere, you get, uh, you're hitting it too hard and you pull way too many G's. And if you come in too thin, you're not grabbed by the atmosphere. Now, if you're below orbital speed, it's stable, because if you get above it, you lose and you'll just fall back. And if you come in, if you get too steep, the lift is upward and it'll push you back to where you are. Above orbital speed, especially a parabolic, which is when you're coming back from the moon. I'm getting a little technical here. <laughs> the, well, you're with the bright people. <laughs> You're going at twice orbital speed, so you, until you get down to orbital speed, 
you need to lift vector down to hold you in the atmosphere because at that speed you'll just hit the atmosphere and fly away and go off on some huge orbit. So you've got to come in and hold the lift down and try to get a lot of that drag. And by the way, it gets awful hot and burns off the things on the heat shield. But above orbital speed is where it gets tricky, especially way up at high speeds, because it's statically unstable. The difference between holding a thing this way and trying to balance it on your finger. Because if you get go into the atmosphere more, you'll get more lift, which or more downward force that'll pull you in more. And if you're above where you want to be, you get less, and then you get less and less, and whoosh, away you go. So you have to control it very closely and very carefully how to make it. How were you spinning at the time? time? Not spinning. You weren't spinning as you were? No, no, no. We're pointed in one direction. And then as we see what we're doing, we rotate just slightly, a little bit this way. We got the lift vector not fully down, but say at uh, 60 degrees down, so you get some lateral. And then every once in a while, we'd have to flip to the other side so that we could snake our way towards the target. How, so, fast, how fast is orbital speed? Uh, 30, orbital speed is whatever it is, about 24,000 feet per second. Right so, around that. What's that in miles an hour? Well, who's got their calculator here? <laughs> I got my slide roll. Does that will do it. <laughs> Feet per second, uh, I mean, uh, I can't 88 is, not, is 60 miles per hour, right? I remember that somewhere. So it's about 50% above one or the other, 1.5 roughly. So, uh, pair of so 24,000 feet per second would be something like 16,000 miles an hour. Okay. To go to the moon or to escape velocity is about 36,000 uh, feet per second. So we have to get from 36 down to 24, and after that it's pretty smooth sailing, relatively speaking, although you can end up pretty far away. But despite all these uncertainties, and we designed it, I wish Bard were here. Bard and I gave a presentation to, and I wish Ev was here, to the club up in Littleton. It's a lot better when you had someone to hold up things and help you. Um, when we were doing uh, our uh, steering there, it was very worrisome. If they didn't like us going long distance, if you do it correctly, you can go out three, four, or five thousand miles. But to do it, you have to dip in that and get it to just the right speed and then take an arc back out of the atmosphere and come down a couple of thousand miles downrange. So for a period you've lost control when you're up where there isn't much atmosphere. And NASA thought it'd be better if they didn't do that. Well, it turned out there were some flights for various reasons they did it somewhat. But uh, the astronauts had the stick that North American did, and early in the game, especially the early ones, all said, we aren't going to sit there with any stinking computer telling us what to do. We're going to take over, and I want to fly it. I don't want to be there, which is only natural. They were pilots, after all. Pilots want to fly. But as far as I know, on all the Apollo flights, not one ever touched that stick to try to take over flying at all. What they didn't count on, including Chris Kraft told people many, many times, he said, these are trained astronauts. They'll never, ever make a mistake. They made so many mistakes, it was incredible. <laughs> like, they, like, they started like. the computer over with pre-launch. They put in the wrong things. They did the wrong things. We were always saying, now what have they done? The reason is, of course, that they got very tired. They never got any sleep. This was five, six, seven days out there. They could try to get little snatches. They didn't, it isn't like this capsule now where there's room. They were just in a small little place there. And they were so tired when they got back to do re-entry. The last thing they wanted to do was a very delicate, Piling exercise. Now, as I wrote in the, something I put out then, the attitude when they got there was, we're almost back. Hey, Jeeves, take me home. <laughs> Park me in the garage. <laughs> they wanted nothing to do. They wanted our automatic control system. And it was 
we were good. We usually got within a mile of the landing site. So considering all the distances and what was going on, it was, and the fact that we couldn't, we were working on really primitive models with a computer that's a lot slower than anything you've got now. Nowadays, talking about things, they recompute, like your GPS. You got GPS, yeah. Recompute. So whenever they're doing now space things, if they get in a little off, they recompute where they think they're going to do, run a whole thing, project ahead, do it all because they can do it. And we had no such thing. Our computing was so primitive, there was no way. All we did is had the equations that was in one of these books passed around, and we tried to, to stay fairly close to the model and follow it follow it in there and, and uh, but I mean we did engineering that's what we did to figure out all these models and reference trajectories and, fig and ran a lot of simulations which are the deviations if you don't do this and don't do that and so on and it worked it worked and that was a, one of the nice things about it and uh, I'll show you a few more and before you leave the control discussion did, did you do any control from the ground Good question. Actually, very interesting. Repeat the question. Was there any control from the ground? Uh, no, there was navigation from the ground, but no control. No guidance even, really, but there is. But originally, the MIT designed it as self-contained. They wanted to send a package off the moon with nobody, off to Mars with nobody touched it for a few years. There wasn't any ground control when they did it. And the first uh, good flight to the moon, Apollo 8, that, uh, oh God, now what I need is Google. Lovell and a couple others, I think, were on. I'm trying to remember who they were. Borman, I think. Uh, they went to the moon, circled it, and came back. And they didn't give them any ground updates. So the entire navigation was done on board. And to do it, they, it's a little tricky. They had a thing called a space sextant and they look out a window and they look at the angle between the edge, the limb of a moon or a star. They had a star catalog of about 20 stars and between stars. And then you feed it in a computer. They have plenty of time while you're coasting back from the moon. So you, you could spend 30 seconds doing a calculation and it was no big deal. And they steered Apollo 8 all the way back from the moon and had very, very good results with uh, I think Lovell being the prime one that took the space sextant and did the measurements. After that, they had uh, position updates from the ground. I think they even had velocity updates from the ground. Yeah, I'm sure. State vectors, the position, velocity, and time from the ground. But then on board, computed what the guidance, where you should do, compute ahead, and then the control is making it go and included autopilots, which is the thing. Autopilots is the finest control that just keeps you on the thing, the course that you wanted to. I should get Bob Piper to explain autopilots. He worked with, at least with over in England or, or Europe. Where, you were in Germany, right? But you didn't do autopilots, you did. I was practicing wine with lunch. Wine with lunch, all right. <laughs> so, um, now what was I about to say? I don't know. I, I'm losing it all. You anyway. got ten more minutes and then questions. All right. Well, you can interrupt for questions anytime you want. After the first flight that went there, SDC put out a nice book with all our about all of us. And uh, let's see who I can. See. I noticed that Phyllis Rye is in this book. Oh, I want to see that. But here is. I'll pass it this way. You won't recognize who this guy is here. We'll see if anybody knows. You got way more than ten minutes. That's what I thought. Um, good. So Dan, can you remember the first time that this thing that you were working on was actually put into use? Oh yes. <laughs> how, how did you feel? I mean. Oh, it was great. The first flight was one called my friend Alex's. Each pre-wired read-only memory was called a rope for reasons by the way they wired it so that little module had passed around. 
And there was someone called the rope mother who was in charge of the, make sure that everything was right for that flight. You were the one in charge. And for uh, what we called AS-202, which later on got a different Apollo something or other number. It was unmanned. And Alex, a good friend, was. And they put it all together. And when it flew, it actually did everything correctly and came down pretty well. And everything we was pretty good about it. Everybody was ready to celebrate. Then I was the rope member for uh, well, the numbers we used then were Saturn, Apollo 4 and, and 6. No, Saturn SA 501, 502, where it was the Saturn 5. That's why it had five numbers. Later on, they were changed to Apollo 4 and Apollo 6 because they renamed them later, revisionist history. I have to think about what they were. They were first unmanned flights with, Apollo, with the Saturn 5, and we used our stuff on it. Uh, we didn't guide the Saturn or the other. We took over after they got separated and they're just the, the final stage. But I was down in Florida watching that thing and it was incredible. That was the biggest, biggest firecracker you ever saw. The noise was incredible. And what's his name in the TV booth? Cronkite? One of the guys like that did it then. He had up and grabbed, he thought the window was going to shake loose because there was so much vibration. On TV you can see him reaching for the window the, to uh, hold it steady. These, those guys down there in Redstone Arsenal, which is in Huntsville, built the design, and then they built some of them, and some more were built in Florida, or no, Louisiana, I believe. But those are incredibly big, big things. That was the height of big engineering. The vertical assembly building down there, where they could put it all together. You, I went up to you know 45th story, and then you could go up to the roof, and go out and look all around, and so on. Wow. Gigantic building. It's still down there. You, they take tours if you ever get to Cape Kennedy. I've been there in a long, long time, and it's assembled vertically on this whole thing, and then they open a million sliding doors that go up and up and up, and roll it out very slowly with those uh, mobile launcher or something that takes it out all the way to the launching pad. Um, let's see what I had written here, if I can read it. The, uh, the problem that I thought was really going to get us is that, and the hardest for us is that, you, like a regular computer, you just put in a variable and you don't have to worry about it. And it can be any size because the floating point can be teeny tiny and big and it all works, you don't have to worry. And we had to scale everything so you had to know every variable whether it was going to get too big or too small or what was going to happen. So it, there was a lot of work there. And when I was out in Berkeley actually, uh, talked to one of my sons, the professor wanted to know interesting people to talk and he heard I'd done this, so I gave a short talk on it, about 15 minutes one time. And I said that that problem, we were always worried that we had misscaled something and it would overflow or something awful would happen. I said, nowadays all computers have floating points, so there's no problem. And the professor popped up, oh no, they don't. Do you know that down there's Texas <coughs> Instrument, all their digital signal processing doesn't have floating point? They ought to got to do just what you did, and scale all those variables. I said, oh my God, because there's so much DSP used all over for uh, digital signals for, uh, well, I don't know where all they use, them. Foyer transforms, all the stuff. It's tough mathematics. and I didn't think they were doing scaling like that nowadays. Let me mention one other problem that we had encountered, and it actually caused some problems. If you want to generate a, a variable and this guy was trying to get earth rate he could have gone and looked up but for a lot of calculations you have to know earth rate how fast the earth is going to rotate you can look it up in any manual but instead of doing that he just took his own calculation he wrote down he says well we know that it takes 24 hours for the earth to go around so it's 24 times 60 times 60 times 3600 which is 86,400, I believe. That's how many seconds. And you take that, and one revolution is two pi uh, radians, 
and I'll come up with Earth Ray. And he did, and was used for quite a while through some test flight. But that's incorrect. Does any of the engineers know why that's wrong? It's what we see as Earth Ray, because that's how long it takes the Earth to go around and look at the sun again. But the Earth is really it's moving. moving. And that's how long, not how long. The Earth actually rotates once in inertial space and in 23 hours and 56 minutes. And each of those adds, and when you get through with that at the end of a year, you've gone around the sun once more. So we had to correct that. But there are so many subtle errors that could come up through things like that that you thought were right and seemed right, but they aren't always that way. So yeah. Every parameter you dealt with, like six degrees of freedom, right? Yeah. Each one of those parameters you defined in a statistical way, each one had a distribution. Uh, well, we didn't do a distribution. We just wanted to know the scaling, the max and min, and what values are reasonable for that variable. We could, we couldn't, if it got bigger than we allowed for it, we'd be in big trouble with overflow. God okay, knows what Okay, so you were happen. concerned about the max and the min. Yeah. So the, uh, a lot of work went into that. Some of us got really, really busy. Not as much in the engineering as when we were trying to put these, all these programs together for multiple flights and, and uh, making different releases and having NASA come around all the time banging on your tunk, tunk, tunk. For the most part, we worked with Aaron Cohn for the first three or four years. He was a terrific guy to work for. He eventually became the uh, Houston Man Space Center, whatever it's called now, replaced Kraft and became the director about 20 years later. But uh, we had a deal with, uh, I had a lot of dealings with Joe Shea. I don't think anybody here knows Joe Shea. He, when something went wrong on Apollo, he was the guy that got the axe, he was the scapegoat for it, and it wasn't really his fault. But somebody had to, you know, somebody had to go, and Joe Shea. Joe Shea uh, was an aggressive guy and did his, a lot of work. From how he described in the paper, I would say he was like Bruce Murray. For, and Joe Shea was abrasive and got things done. He got his PhD from Michigan, but he was a fellow in there. And then he eventually got drummed out. But I used to, when we go to Houston, I used to play squash with Joe down there. The astronauts' gym had squash courts. And I, I was pretty good at squash in the 60s, and we'd go over and play with Joe Shea. And he was so tenacious, he'd stay there a lot longer than he should have. I should have taken care of him easily, but Joe was <laughs> really tough. Anyway, I did probably nobody here ever heard of Joe Shea. But this is a big, big engineering project, although it was done, our part of it was done by relatively few people. Most of all the engineering was done by the by 20 or 30 people there before we started to scale up all the programming work. So it wasn't a large organization by any means. And everybody knew everybody, so there was a lot of working back and forth and a lot of helping and doing things. Speaking of Ed Cops, which I did there, I'll bet you guys didn't know that Ed Cops is the father of GPS. Uh, when we Actually, just after we left the lab, they got a contract with Holloman Air Force Base, Mel Birnbaum and the others there, to develop a thing called CIRIS, or CIRIS, C-I-R-I-S. And that was the original engineering study and it went on for a number of years, and uh, Ed was leading a group for ours who did it. And then eventually, when they went to implementation and putting satellites up there, a whole lot of people got involved. But they kept working on it for years. Bard, by then, was working for TASC, and they did a look at all of that stuff and tried to analyze how many errors in the GPS. The original, it was going to be military only, with a degraded version that so the general public couldn't get all that detailed information about where you were. But eventually, I think right now, GPS is probably, I don't know if it's as good as the military version of GPS, because I don't know. 
What? It's pretty good. Yeah, it's awful good. That's all I know. And of course, I don't have a GPS, but my <laughs> cell phone tells me, when I click it, it tells me where I am all the time. Well, interestingly enough, Francois and I took a trip through eastern Canada yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. And we were always a block or two off on our turns. Really? And I was wondering, now maybe they didn't, yes, get what we got. Huh. Were the turns given by the talking? It, 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 I would turn too soon. We were going from south to uh, and, and west to north and, and uh, east. I don't really have, I think it's probably a problem with the program that was generating it. I doubt if the GPS signals coming from those satellites are degraded for being in Canada. <laughs> we don't like Canadians. Oh. <laughs> you can, it's five minutes and then that's it. No, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. Anybody with any questions, give me it right now while I look at any more uh, little notes that I wrote down at the last minute here. What's cops doing now? Uh, I saw him in July. He, came, he comes up to New England for about a month in the summer. I saw him in Tampa and I thought he seemed really spacey. You saw him there too, and others that were there. He seemed to it's something wrong. With him. Something wrong, and he wouldn't talk. He usually goes on <laughs> for hours, and he he didn't. He just seemed like he was withdrawn, and I didn't know if he was sick, had a problem, some sort of. A lot of us has physical things, but in July he was the old dad. He was talking. He was going on. He seemed fine. He's got a scruffy beard like some of the rest of us, but. He, he just seemed wanted to very get good. Into the Sox game free. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the night before you, you could get in free to the Sox if you had a beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, what? What did you say? A dollar? One dollar. Oh, it was one dollar. That's right. I forgot. It is one dollar. Is Nancy still around? Yes. They live uh, almost in Jacksonville. It's actually in Georgia, right along the St. Mary's River in a de nice, you know, golf development. He looks out on the golf course and all of that stuff. And he goes into Jacksonville now. Well, he used to go in on the weekends to get stuff. What's the other one of these? Doesn't mean much. Oh, RSS time of flight air versus initial range. That just shows some of the engineering. You have to run a lot of calculations. <laughs> And here it shows you for a different L over D's. Yeah. All right. Haven't looked at those in 50 years. What's the date on it? 1960. Yeah, oh, God. It was sometime in the 60s. Diane. More questions? Diane. What, what do you see happening to the space? I have yeah. no idea. It looks cr crazy because they haven't done anything for such a long time although that thing up there that they keep adding to and adding to it's gotten really big in orbit and very capable but it, and scientists like it because they get to do all sorts of things away from gravity but they haven't done any expedition in so long they've done a number of unmanned and there's a lot of people that can say you can do more unmanned than you can man i visited we visited JPL. In fact, my younger son worked one summer, whatever it is, at JPL, which does all the unmanned stuff. And one of the guys we worked with, Alan Klump, went out there and, uh, in the late 90s we were visiting. He gave us a nice tour of JPL. JPL's really interesting, um, putting those two on uh, Mars, the Curiosity and whatever the other one is called. They put uh, rovers, right? Mars rovers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they're sending back a lot of good information, although it doesn't make a lot of front headlines anymore. But there are some scientists who are really happy. They keep saying, "Are we going to find water?" I think they've got water traces, but they don't find any traces of methane. That's what they were looking for, right? Who follows all of this? They were hoping they could see some methane one way or another, but they haven't really. Um, so are all the people kind of disappearing? Yes. Yeah, the people aren't disappearing. They're actually 
dying off. I keep getting emails about so and so's funeral, and a lot of the other people are in nursing homes if they are still alive. So it's getting hard to keep up with some of them. Um, Do you have reunions? Not as such, and we should. We've had a couple. We had a big one uh, on the. 50, 40th anniversary, what anniversary was it, Sue? Do you remember where it was over at MIT, they invited a lot of, must have been the 40th, because it was about four years ago. And I had a chance, I hadn't seen Neil Armstrong in a long time, so I went over and said hello to him, he was there. I'm sure he didn't remember me from, of course I don't look anything like I did in the 60s either. But Is that a picture of you in there? Yes. Okay, <laughs> we'll look at it. Your name is on that page, but didn't look like, that's didn't me. Look like then. That right. was a strange period right in there. Like everybody <laughs> was wearing long sideburns and funny hair stuff and so on. And a tie. Oh well, a lot of we always wore a tie in the fifties and sixties. I wore a tie to work every day. It wasn't until probably the seventies we began to have not wear ties. Um, we traveled around a lot, and IBM was really full suits, oh, yeah. white shirts, they were really supposed to be. But this TV program, which I've only seen a little bit, Mad Men, <laughs> makes people think that's the way everybody was. And that is not true at all. <laughs> Mad Men, what Madison Avenue was like, and they were at one extreme, what Madison right. Avenue was. The people I know just worked in research labs and universities and so on. So they weren't as, they'd have some sort of dress code and they'd go to work with a coat and tie and often they'd take the coat off right away and get to get down to work. But that, that was true whether I was visiting uh, NASA in Houston or in Huntsville or aircraft aerospace companies or anyone else you went to that I knew which were all in the engineering domain. They all were about the same, except for IBM. They were a little more uptight, as they were said in those days. <laughs> but we uh, we all left after Apollo. A lot, a group. We started Intermetrics, and that included Ed and me, Ed Cops, and um, Jim Flanders, John Miller, and Jim Miller, who aren't brothers, but they. Five, we started the company. It did all right for a number of years. Was Eventually, that Jim uh, was the SA? pardon? Was that Jim Flanders who was an SA? No. Jim, was there a Jim Flanders in SA? I didn't know was, he wasn't in. Yeah, Flanders, yeah. There was. was a senior when I arrived. Yeah. No, okay. not not that. Jim Flanders was in the aero department. He got an aero degree, and he was around. You probably saw him there. He was. Uh, he always had a khakis and a brown jacket looked very spiffy. His father was Senator Ralph Flanders from Vermont. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, he wasn't an essay. No, he was not. He was in my class then. Yes. Right, I, I never thought I remember the name. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. He was over there. He was not at all because he was a, back, a veteran. He was a Navy pilot during World War II. Yeah. And, uh, he, had a he had a big family already. He yes. And he talked about making carrier landings and what it was frightening. If you could make a landing on a carrier and you could walk away, it was successful. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote a letter to, uh, oh God, there was a book put out about growing, oh, what's, see, names, 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 puzzled me, uh, a columnist, he worked for many newspapers and he wrote a book about growing up in uh, near Bal he worked for a Baltimore paper for a long time and then he wrote this book and in it he talked about his problem during the World War II trying to pass his, with the Navy to pass, his, get through it. and he had terrible troubles and the night before his last test and he had the worst instructor, the one that flunked everybody so he said it was hopeless and he went out and got drunk the night before and came home in wee hours in the morning, went out to do his test and this is the author of the book. 
And the next day, everything went perfectly. He had to do it. They told him to do this. Whatever he did, he could do it. Now. And this instructor who flunked everybody came out and said, I don't understand. Why did the guy flunk it before? He's the most perfect student I've ever passed. <laughs> anyway, Jim Flanders wrote him a letter saying almost the same thing happened to me when I was trying to get my wings in the Navy. Um, Go back to Anterometrics and tell us what you did. We started the company, got going in 1970, and we were going to do a whole lot of things, but very few of them worked out, so we, we got a lot of business from the government still. Um, Ed was in the charge of the group that went off and did Cirrus, and then, uh, which it turned to GPS. I was working on some compilers. We built a compiler that was still used for the space shuttle until they finally shut down the last year or two. We wrote it in the 70s, and then NASA took all the tapes, all the compilers, all the information, all the written, and tore them, burned them, destroyed all of them. And I had a, a friend, Craig Schulenberg, I worked with, wrote, he'd been working in Houston, and he said, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? So a couple of guys went and rescued as much as they can and established it someplace. But nobody knows why people issue these orders like that. God knows. But uh, Intermetrics kept going. We did uh, uh, a lot of work with that compiler, it lasted well into the 80s. We did a large job for IBM uh, that uh, Jim Miller ran. The comp and then had, we had a big group down in Houston and in California. Ed was in California for a while for that. We had an operation down near Seal Beach. They had some in. Uh, down in Huntsville, and near Johnsville, Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia, was a sizable group. So the company got up to five to six hundred people at its peak, but then things slowed and there was a change. One crazy guy came around and tried to get off. Everybody in those days, we've got to do commercial products, got to do commercial products. And this guy was from the Air Force and he didn't know about commercial products, so they got led down the garden path. But. Uh, they eventually sold out to somebody who sold it. I think it's now probably part of Lockheed Martin. Everything is part of Lockheed Martin nowadays. But there isn't much left. Uh, uh, there's not much left in the Boston Cambridge area. But there were there was a big operation outside of D.C. in Northern Virginia that was still rolling last time. But the number of people working on that gets big. And all the people I used to work for, there were MITRE and all those, a lot of them are all working on black projects. That's all they tell you. We're on black projects. There's an awful lot of money on black projects. <laughs> black uh, holes or what? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's all the projects given out by the, the NSA and the CIA and people like that. The, projects that you're not, no one's supposed to know anything, even what if you're working on it or what there is. There also were people, uh, when I was working there, that uh, were doing a lot of poverty projects. There's a lot of money in poverty, as a friend of mine. <laughs> but not nearly as the amount of money in black ops. The number of peoples and the billions spent they spend something like 80 billion just on intelligence, not counting military intelligence, just the CIA, NSA, and all the various ones they track separately. And the military has its own versions of those things that they, you can't break out the budget. Probably somebody can, but it's not easy to find. They're all funded on faith. Funded on faith. Faith engineering. Uh, Here's another engineering report on Polaris, and you'll see the sort of things you do in those days. Because there weren't many fancy computers, and you had to generate equations in motion. There was a lot more calculus and equation solving than they do nowadays. Now, most engineering, including the bridges from what I can figure out, they have some program, and they just feed in their data, and it tells you what to do. And my relation is, I used to do income tax, and I would be very good at it. It took longer than I wanted, but I knew what I was doing and everything, why it was there. I could defend it any time. Now I have no idea. TurboTax just does it, gives me the result. 
and I have no idea every time they change the law what it is, whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> and I've had these programs give me totally wrong results, which turned out they asked a different question, I answered it differently, did something. But there's no way I have any idea of what's going on. And engineers now just don't seem to have any rule, any idea of size, of magnitude, or what to do. And if this thing says and it should put in uh, 100 tons of concrete and it only gives them 10, they don't know the difference. They'll go on and build it until it falls down. Okay. Have you been following the uh, uh, San Onofre uh, reactor shutdown? And the, uh, apparently they did exactly what you were describing. Uh, the, they wanted to have more tubes in the same space and this Japanese firm put the information in the uh, uh, the computer. And the computer says, you know, these are your design parameters. So that's what they built. But it was wrong. Is this the they, they one said, in Japan? The this is the Fukushima? No, no. This is uh, San Onofre in uh, uh, California. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I didn't know that. I hadn't heard that yet. The huge numbers in Japan. Uh, Actually, it responded to earthquakes exactly what it was supposed to. The problem was sighting it if we're near the ocean where you get yeah. uh, those giant, what do you call those? Tsunamis. 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 God, that was such a stupid overall planning to put it where you could have a tsunami. No, they had those seawalls. They thought the seawalls could control Yeah, but tsunamis. putting it near a tsunami, I think mm -hmm. there's so many other, I mean, if they moved to, to the Western part of Japan, you go up a lot higher. There's places you're not. I mean, Japan has had so many tsunamis. I mean, there was a terrible one in the 20s, that, uh, and then they come all the way across the Pacific. I don't understand what keeps them going and why the energy doesn't dissipate. But I'm not an engineer in any of that stuff. That is an exception to what you were saying about getting it right uh, on the computer. If you're in civil engineering and you're building a bridge or a dam or anything like that, if you're wrong, you very soon find out. Yeah. You build it and it's not right. <laughs> the Bay Bridge, which they closed over Labor Day weekend to cut over to the new one, which because the old one is still being used. And last May or so, they found out when they were looking that these huge six, seven foot long bolts like had been corroding and were were not going to be used. Now the trouble is they couldn't take them out exactly because there was other structure there. And they worked for quite a while and they th think they have a workaround or something that'll get it there. But the problem, you know, it was just the wrong bolts, the wrong spec, the wrong something on it. And the whole thing is costing over six billion dollars to build that um, new replacement for the Bay Bridge. After there was a terrible earthquake in, when was it, so 89? Yeah, that parts fell down and <laughs> cars and people were killed underneath it. And um, now it's much stronger and goes around to the side. I imagine the old one will sometime come down. The interesting to me, I'm not a civil engineer, is all the suspension bridge there have lived through earthquakes since they were built in around 37 and there's never been a problem with the suspension bridge. It's always the other type, the, the erector set, whatever you call those structures that are made out of trusses and so on that have had all the troubles in earthquake. Those huge bolts, by the way, are not primary support. They're the ones that are supposed to help when it sways in an earthquake. And that bridge that fell down in Minneapolis, it's that type of bridge anymore. I don't know why suspension bridges are so much better than the other type. They just seem to do. Maybe it's not something I've ever looked at. But suspension bridges have a lot of redundancy and they don't have those other bridges. One, uh, like they put in a fitting, uh, whatever you call it, and it wasn't the right and it failed. And then the thing can pull apart. Connector. Yeah, a connector. Like. The suspension just has so many, I mean suspensions have been buildings at the Brooklyn Bridge that they started before 1880. The Rosser, I mean the German engineers came over and figured out how to build that bridge in Brooklyn. I 
can't imagine how they did it with the technology of those days. Although a lot of guys, including some of the engineers, got damaged by working below the um, river there, over there to whatever it was, the East River to Brooklyn. <laughs> anyway, we were very, very, uh, it's, it was very well controlled to about 64, or late 64, and then it, all of a sudden we had to go run, run, run to keep up. Um, a lot of things happened. Bard worked for us till about a year later, and then he went got back and got his PhD. And uh, he wasn't with us during a, all the programming mess, but there were a lot of other people. And uh, sometimes we were so busy, we were running things every night. I remember one year, I was home on Labor Day, and I went to the lab to work every day after that till Thanksgiving, including Saturdays and Sundays. It was just every day you went in. That was what the life was during the critical part. It wasn't all the time, but that was when everybody got really, really busy. Also, I'll tell you something else that happened that there, Alex and all the, most of the rest of us who were doing all the work, uh, every one of us got divorced. <laughs> we wonder why. <laughs> yeah, that one's me. Oh, have a look. It is I. Yeah, thank you. should say in English. Well, Which it's one? The left. This is Dan? Yeah. Oh, really? Do you want it held up? Well, if we had more prep, I probably, I, what I wanted to come up with was some Thank more you. online display things, but it, it wasn't readily available, and I sent emails, and none, they, none of us know how to connect this laptop to this, because I don't have, I, it's, as uh, Jeff said, he took his wife's laptop, which is bigger, and has the high def connector that could get onto that HTML, whatever yeah. it's called. But I only have oh, one member of the connector. You do? Yeah. Oh, the wire that would go oh, in there. Stranger. So I'll be around and have any more questions, or I'm here right now, or if you have more questions, especially tomorrow morning before we do things, if, uh, I'll be there. Hey, that uh, New Armstrong uh, Museum, is that worth seeing? I don't know. Where is it? In his birth town. In his birthplace, in hometown. Someplace in Ohio. Yeah. We were thinking of going one day, but I don't know what it's worth going. I don't know. A lot of people like the baseball museum in Cooperstown. <laughs> so is that a way of saying don't go? I don't know. You can Google it. For some reason, which I can't connect right now, uh, Ed and Norma, who's not with us anymore. Hasselman. Hasselman. Ed knew Jim McDivitt and had kept up and I, for the life of me, can't remember Ed told me how he knew Jim McDivitt and that Jim was out there somewhere in California doing all right. But I've lost track of most of these guys. there's one upstairs. So do we have directions to where we go tonight? We're going to get them when we can We can almost walk. Six o'clock? No, you won't be able to find me either. Uh, wouldn't have known this, you? Anyway, I have an old thing. I just grabbed some to come down here. Uh, for, when Bard and I went up to see out, we put together a little thing like a group of slides and something that we could put up that was sort of logical. Hey, maybe when they come to Singapore, you can go give a talk. Yeah, well. What do you think? That would be fun. Okay. If yeah. I ever get to Singapore. Oh, this thing to China. Yeah, I know. And I, dance cards getting fuller and fuller. My kids <laughs> over there are finding other things for me to do. But I'll have to come again, which you won't be long. We'll, that's what happens. When you're in demand. I, maybe I should oh, stay man, long to figure yeah. out something else. So popular. <laughs> yeah. I'm going, any of you didn't hear that, I'm going to China on Christmas Day. Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh, that's for the wedding, right? For, yeah, the redo wedding. Oh, the redo. My son's, her family's having a Chinese oh, okay. ceremony, a Chinese wedding, whatever that's like. I've been told I have to bring 
a ra roast suckling pig. <laughs> <laughs> traditional, the groom's traditional. father brings one. Right? Yes, plus lots of gold. <laughs> uh, check with uh, Dreyfus, he's going to Hong Kong. Yeah, when no, is he going to be in Hong Kong? I'll have to November, send him an yeah. email then. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Sure. Anytime. Those are the good old days, my friend. Yes. <laughs> did, did you guys watch the Discovery program at Demo? Oh, yes. Yeah. There's, if any of you see it, there's a five-hour discovery space something or other that t goes through various ones. And one of the hours is just about the guidance and the yeah. mostly shot. British guys came up and interviewed us at MIT about seven years ago and put it out. I think it's quite well done. It's shown on various channels. You also can get the DVDs. I have some at home. I didn't think of that. I could have run yes, it, it was it was very good. Even I could understand it. <laughs> I found it very hard. Maybe you guys have done interviews. He has lots of time. The guy was really good that did the interviews. But instead of where you see the back and forth of an interview, they had structured it so the guy asked me a lot of questions and I answered. But they didn't want the question answer in it. So they wanted me to phrase it as though no one had asked me a, like a you were question, yes, like I'm just. Yeah talking because they didn't want they wanted only to have me in the thing and not the moderator the, the question <laughs> I found that awkward uh, well you know you did very well I wouldn't have known that there was a, a, a response to a question yeah they That's almost all were responses it. Yeah. it was very good I enjoyed Dan thank you oh, thank you Dan yeah, thank you Dan you're an inspiration <laughs> hey, he's our breaking rights <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. I imagine the courage you took. Yeah, that's right. What was, what was the first time when somebody actually tried to come back? How did you feel? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. What do I do with this? I went to. Uh, I, I guess I guess I switch it off. Hang on a minute, John. I don't know how to switch this off. Anybody knows anything about this? Hold the plug. I don't know where. Uh, Hold the plug and that turns it off. Well, it's running. I think it's on. It's on battery. <laughs> uh oh. Really? I can't see a thing. You know, farmers plow fields controlled by satellites with almost automatic tractors. As far as the depth and the direction and everything. That does that too? It's all by satellite. Don't get me going on pipelines. I'm fairly liberal about some stuff, but this pipeline is the most futile thing. I asked a whole lot of people and I got others. Okay, now if you stop this pipeline from Canada, how many barrels of oil will we save in the U.S.? Zero. That thing's irrelevant anymore. It's it, right. It doesn't totally matter whether we build it or don't build it. That's true. But not building it doesn't save us. It, it doesn't do a damn bit of good. And the guy McKibben said, "Oh well, our pipelines. We don't want this new pipeline and still running in four years." And I said, "So you rather have a hundred-year-old pipeline forty years from now when they get old?" And uh, the guys are just campaigning all over, and none of it makes sense. The pipeline isn't going to change a damn thing whether they do it or not. Well, my pipelines are water lines. Yours are water. Well, that makes sense. By the way, Cal they, someone else proposed a uh, pipeline running to California to feed the refineries, and they don't want it because they claim they can shop around pipeline. They got to sign a long-term contract. They're shipping it. Well, you can ship it by rail, rail. car. Do you know railroads go right? Just inland from here, they go across New Hampshire and Maine. Every once in a while, I still feel like I'm going to find out where the best price is and then yes. ship it by rail to that. So, where did you guys well, go for lunch today? Here's why they go by so much. There's an awful fire in Quebec where that's American oil. From North Dakota, they come this way, they go through um, New Hampshire and Maine, and they go to the giant Irving refinery in New Brunswick, and they'll send 150, the train made of 150 tank cars of that so, oil from so uh, North Dakota. And it turns out one of the big reasons when you're on the East Coast like New Brunswick or Canada is you're paying North Sea oil prices rather than West Texas Intermediate. Yeah. Brent is about $15 
a barrel more last time I checked. So that's where you send your oil. <laughs> so you send your oil there, and even if it costs five, six, seven a barrel to ship it, you're still getting a more yeah. than if they send it to that place in Oklahoma where they want the things but to go. But the pipeline is fixed. Yeah. yeah. And there's train lines all over everywhere. Canada shouldn't count on the U.S. Those guys protesting should go to Canada. What they really want is the Canadians to not take out any cars. But it shouldn't be our pipelines that turn. Go to Canada and argue with them because they're dead set they're going to ship. The latest plan, which is the one they probably should do, is an oil pipeline. They're, they have a pipeline already across a lot of Canada. They're going to extend it from Alberta all the way across to Montreal, and then they're going to go around and uh, on to New Brunswick. But then all together, it's like $12 billion to do this whole pipeline. But then they won't be dependent on the United States at all, which is what they should do with echo terrorists and whatever else you got there. You could ship it to New Brunswick, and that'll be fine. And they keep saying how dirty the oil is. It turns out the Venezuelan oil is just as dirty as the Canadian oil. I didn't know the Venezuelan was dirty, but I didn't. Okay. That's what they tell me, and, uh, and the Canadian oil is getting cleaner all the time because they have the process. It's beautiful, beautiful. Nice and clean, yeah. uh, And I don't know why, they, they do the same process. They go down into the horizontal drilling and all of that. They love it in North Dakota because you've got a sparsely populated state. They're trying to frack in New York, and oh, they're screening. They don't care in North Dakota. They're shipping, they, last I counted, maybe higher now, five, uh, what are my units? Million barrels a day, right? Uh, five million barrels a day? Yeah, that's about right. I thought it was bigger than that, but maybe that's what it is. Yeah, that's what I thought. And it's been going up. It was just something that keeps going. They're getting a lot out of that North Dakota. They need workers like crazy out there. It's almost in Canada. I went through Williston once when we were driving back on the Northern Way. What a boom town. You can't do anything. Guys are sleeping in cars and pickups and wherever they can. And they're trying to build facilities. Your yeah, your machine is too on. Yeah. City, Montana. Yeah. He says, boy, all that population and everything, all they need for the places to stay, though.